May I begin on your behalf by expressing appreciation for the diligent, effortful, behind the stage efforts by Pavel and his organizing committee over the last many years to make this event possible. I'm reminded of the Chinese proverb, when drinking from a stream, remember its source. When drinking from a stream, remember its source. Our first keynote speaker is Peter B. Smith, Emeritus Professor of Social Psychology from the University of Sussex, where he worked for over three decades. Many of you will know him as a past president of the IACCP, and also, of course, as a journal editor of the Journal of Cross-Cultural Psychology. I'm sure as submitters to journals, you appreciate the effort and the uh, discipline required to be an editor these days, dealing with reviewers like us. Uh, emeritus, interesting word, comes from Latin, meaning, I think, because of merit. In Professor Smith's case, a clarity of expressing complex ideas about carefully collected multicultural data, judiciously interpreted, and inspiring further work by identifying intriguing possibilities that lie unearthed from the data. For much of this time on task, he has benefited all of us through his synthesis and his updating, his constant updating of the research base in cross-cultural social psych organizational psych, personality psychology. One way in which many of you here have known Peter. His curiosity and his enterprise lead him to accept intriguing, even though difficult, challenges. One of which he faces today as he will explain. I, for one, have listened to Peter speak at conferences for three decades, and I'm still in the room, still eager to see what he has produced. The latest chapter in his intellectual voyage. Peter. I always enjoy listening to what you say, although I never know what it's going to be. It's always something unexpected. Uh, when Pavel approached me in Nagoya and asked me to give this talk, he said, Peter, come to Warsaw and talk about Brexit. And I said, no, I absolutely am not going to do that. It is much too raw and much too painful an issue for me to address since the conference in Nagoya was only a month after Brexit was first voted for. But I softened and I agreed to give the talk and I agreed to give it not on Brexit. I said there are broader issues at stake here and those issues are absolutely central to the theme of this conference. The European project has been underway for quite some time, but it's under threat. And we need to think about what is Europe, what is happening in Europe, why is it happening in Europe, and what's to be done about it. 
And so as a small contribution to that very large question, I'm going to discuss with you what is Europe and how may we best understand it in terms of the kinds of concepts which cross-cultural psychologists have addressed themselves to. So if we start to think about Europe, this is the beginning. Uh, here is Europa, uh, and Europe has been a mixture right from the start. Europa is about to engage in a conversation with that bull there, uh, but she's Lebanese, and she was portrayed by a Greek who lived in Italy. So we've been all mixed up for quite some time, and Europe, whatever it is, is a blend of many different things. Europa was first committed to that vase uh, more than 2,000 years ago, but Europa is still very much with us. If you take out a five euro note and hold it up to the light and look through the transparent bit, there is Europa smiling out at you. Uh, and she is an image of what we all try to achieve. If we talk about European diversity, we need to start searching around for what we mean when we look at the different elements within what may be a European culture. We can think, for example, what uh, issues arise from chopping Europe up into nations. And here we are in contemporary Europe with, I think, 44 different nations, uh, each of which um, approaches the issues that we are concerned with in somewhat different ways. But this is all very recent. If we look at Europe 100 years ago, we find there were only 20 nations. So nation state, as a way of thinking about Europe, is a negotiable and uh, variable way of thinking about Europe. The events and cross-currents which have flowed through Europe over the past centuries have also left us with all kinds of strange, distinctive perspectives. If you are able to figure out exactly how Europe divides into those six different regions, I will congratulate you. But I would like to tell you that this is a map showing the different kinds of electric plugs which are used in different parts of Europe. It is a legacy of all kinds of cross-cultural communications. How does it come about that France and Poland have something in common with each other in relation to electric plugs? whereas a number of other countries, including Denmark, the UK, and Italy, are distinctive and unique. So these are ways of thinking about European diversity. You can also think about European diversity in terms of what is the principally most frequent genetic marker in populations in each country. And again, you find that Europe will fragment into different ways, uncorrelated with electric plugs and possibly uncorrelated with the conceptual frameworks that we find most useful. If we start to generalize about the differences or similarities across Europe between nations, then we also encounter another serious problem. And that is that if we start to think about European diversity, this map shows each country and on that country is imposed the flag of the ethnic group, which is the principal ethnic minority within that country. So generalizations about countries are going to be somewhat confused uh, by the diversity of contemporary populations. So this begins to define some of the difficulties that we might think about in generalizing about Europe. If we move to somewhat more familiar frameworks, then we can draw on the extensive research of Shalom Schwartz, uh, and he has plotted the three value dimensions that have emerged from his research at the nation level. And if you search through that map, you will find that pretty much all of the European nations are on the left-hand side. 
So there is potentially some suggestion of distinctiveness about Europe, which is summarized along his dimensions of embeddedness versus autonomy, with uh, Europeans more focused towards autonomy, and hierarchy versus egalitarianism, with Europeans focused more towards egalitarianism, and hierarchy versus harmony, with Europeans focused more towards harmony than hierarchy. Now these discussions and ways of um, focusing on Europe are all focused on national differences. If you look for differences, you probably find them, but that leaves open the question of whether there are some universalities which are overlooked when we focus only on differences. So what I want to do is I want to think about the, the extent to which Europe can be characterized in terms of this concept which psychologists have recently become interested in, which is unpronounceable, and I will need to explain to some of you what it means, entitativity. In other words, does Europe have some unity of meaning? Uh, is it an entity, uh, or is it, for example, an accident of geographic location? Is there so much variability within it that there is no particular reason to speak about Europe as an entity in its own right? Is it something which is characterized by a legacy of shared values and beliefs which have been derived from the myriad interactions which have been engaged in among people within the broader region of Europe? More recently, is it better to think about it as a civic entity constructed by politicians in a series of countries who have got together and then enlarged the unity of a particular set of nations in an attempt to avert and avoid and compensate for the horrors of two world wars? Is it something which has been created or is it something, is it a project in process which is only now beginning to pass through stages in its development which will need somewhere else? So the, these are the questions that I am addressing. I need to address also a crucial question. Is stereotyping Europeans a good idea in the first place? We have um, probably had rather more comparisons between the East and the West in cross-cultural psychology than we can comfortably accommodate. And is it any better to generalize about Europeans versus non-Europeans? I would want to argue that it is a more useful thing to do. Comparisons between East and West have typically involved comparisons of a small number of exemplars. I suppose the stereotypic example would be a comparison between the United States, which is an unusual and aberrant um, culture among individualistic nations, and Japan, which is an unusual and aberrant example among collectivistic nations. So this is not a promising way to make comparisons. And the comparisons that have been made have often been made on measures whose psychometric viability in the two different countries compared has not been established. And almost always the comparisons between East and West have been done in terms of mean scores rather than the variability of those attributes within each nation. So in attempting to generalize about Europe versus elsewhere, I would argue that we're doing a bit more than that. We're focusing on a recognizable historical entity within which a great deal has happened over the last centuries. Uh, we can do so in a way which doesn't just pick one European sample and one non-European non sample, but a whole range of samples from within Europe and from outside of Europe and can in, employ scales whose validity has been established. And it would be important that we look to see not just does Europe on some particular scale score higher or lower than somewhere else, but also what is the distribution around that mean? Is there a homogeneity within Europe on any particular attribute in which we're interested? If we start to search the literature, 
to get some sense of where Europe might lie within the kinds of conceptualizations that cross-cultural psychologists have employed. One of the um, key studies of interest is the one that Shinobu Kitayama and his colleagues reported a few years ago in which a series of experimental tasks were completed by samples from what they described as interdependent Japan and independent United States. And this study also included uh, samples from the UK and Germany as a representation of Europe. And in that paper, Shinobu reached the conclusion that Europe was somehow intermediate between Japan and the USA. This provides an interesting starting point, but I think we might need to examine the issue in rather more detail. And in thinking about that, a useful starting position is to look back at the writings of Durkheim about a hundred years ago. He argued that Europe was increasingly developed towards what he called the cult of the individual. He defined individualism as a normal form of collective consciousness comprising ideals, beliefs, and practices that are centered on the value of the individual as a moral absolute, which binds individuals within a society together rather than dividing them. In other words, the, the individual is valued in a collective context and can, that valuing of the individual can occur because an established societal structure is created in which it is okay to trust strangers because of the way in which society has evolved in a collective manner. So that's a very different understanding of individualism than one which we quite frequently find in the literature. And he argued that the growth of the cult of the individual was a consequence of urbanization and secularization, which was occurring in Europe around that time. And you're probably very quickly thinking, well, wait a moment, that happened everywhere else as well. But it happened later, and it happened in a different cultural context. Urbanization in Europe occurred <coughs> around the Industrial Revolution and its consequences, and in most of the rest of the world, those same processes occurred in a post-colonial context where Europe had colonized most of the rest of the world, and the growth of urbanization and industrialization was conducted in a different way that could conceivably have different consequences. So individualism is the key concept around which I am discussing Europeanness. Uh, did individualism disappear during the communist period in Eastern Europe? If we're going to characterize Europe as a whole, we need to consider issues of this kind. And so I want to refer to a study that Ivana Markova and her colleagues did a few years ago in which they examined the social representations of the individual in three East European, or I think they would want to call themselves Central European nations, and France, England, and Scotland. And respondents to this survey were asked what were the prerequisites for the well-being of an individual. And the first factor that came out of that relatively qualitative study was that the answers were very similar from Eastern and Western European samples. In both cases, they emphasized the importance of human rights, freedom, democracy, minority rights, and peace. So there was some preliminary evidence that individualism continued to be valued in both Eastern, Central, and Western Europe. Now, the hypotheses of the study that I'm going to describe to you are three. Firstly, that Europeans are more individualistic than non-Europeans. Secondly, that there is less variance in individualism within Europe than in the rest of the world. And thirdly, that individualistic Europeans will identify more strongly with being Europeans who are not individualistic. Now, by choosing individualism as the key concept in this study, I connect rather directly with what has been the major preoccupation of cross-cultural psychologists over the past several decades, namely 
this obsessive concern with the dimension of individualism and collectivism. It is the preeminent dimension. It's been resistant to reinterpretation. Different people try to argue that it means different things to the point where we sometimes begin to wonder what it means at all. And there are all kinds of issues to do with the valid measurement of what we consider to be individualism or collectivism contingent on the way in which different people have interpreted it in different ways. Now, in, uh, despite that ambiguity, if we look at the results of some of the major cross-national surveys influenced by the pioneering work of Georg Hofstede, you see his four dimensions are listed across the top of that chart, power, distance, uncertainty, avoidance, individualism, collectivism, masculinity, femininity. And then you look to see what happened when the various researches done by Shalom Schwartz, by myself and my colleagues in the World Values Survey and in the GLOBE project, how closely did those, the way that nations were characterized match the characterization achieved by Geert Hofstede. And those correlation coefficients in red are all uh, argument for concurrent validity. They show the same nation as scoring high and low on these different studies, even though individualism and collectivism was measured in different ways. There's only one anomaly down the bottom, which is indicated in blue, where the GLOBE study's measure of uncertainty avoidance correlated with power distance positively and individualism and collectivism negatively. So, we don't need to give up on individualism and collectivism, but we do need to make sure that it's measured in appropriate ways. In order to do that, it's important to go back to Harry Triandis's discussion of individualism and collectivism and to think in terms of what he called cultural syndromes. In other words, that individualism and collectivism has to be thought of as a set of ways of describing different aspects of society, which includes the way in which people think about themselves, the kinds of beliefs that they have about what goes on around them, the kind of values that they have, and the kinds of norms and roles that exist in their cultural context. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on some studies, most of which are drawn from the culture and identity research network uh, initiated by my colleague at Sussex, Viv Vignoles, and the data that he has collected in collaboration with a large number of other people. And I'm also going to look at Schwartz values as a representation of values that may differ between different societies. So the culture and identity research network was built around the following ideas. We need to move beyond bilateral comparisons of single samples, and we need to include multiple samples from diverse nations. We need to unpackage individualism and collectivism into measures of identities and values and beliefs and self-construals, and we need to use multi-level modeling in order to control for response biases such as acquiescence. And there are references to a couple of studies in which the overall findings of these investigations have been already published. In terms of beliefs, the aspect of beliefs that is relevant to individualism, collectivism, has to do with the degree to which you believe that you as a person can be understood without reference to your social context. So here are some, some of the survey items used in the CIRN research. To understand a person well, it's essential to know about which social groups he is a member of. Or here's a reversed item. One can understand a person well without knowing about his or her family. And there are other items of this kind which make up the scale which was used in this study. And some of them were concerned with contextualism as a belief, and some of them, the two at the bottom, were to do with what were called immutability beliefs, the belief that the kind of person someone is is something deeply inherent, um, and it's simply a, pro a, a product of the person, him or herself. In terms of self-constrols, the CIRN research 
network came up with not one measure of independence and interdependence, but seven dimensions of self-conception. Um, I've put up here some examples of each of the seven scales, for example, in terms of self-reliance. One statement said, I prefer to be self-reliant rather than depend on others. And the other end of the scale was exemplified by, I prefer to turn to other people for help rather than solely rely on myself. So each of these seven dimensions identifies a different aspect of independence and interdependence. And in the survey which was conducted, these dimensions came out as separate from each other. So they're not simply different uh, and correlated aspects of independence and interdependence. They're separate and therefore to be examined individually. I want to pick out the third one there, difference. Being a unique individual is important to me versus similarity to others. I would avoid standing out among my friends. Right, so these are some of the measures that were employed in the CRN study. And in order to use them for the purpose of this talk, uh, we need to think about another important question, and that is, where is Europe? Europe is defined to the north by water, it's defined to the left, to the west by water, it's defined to the south by water, and then we have all kinds of trouble to the east. Where does Europe end? Some people say Europe ends at the Urals, and some people say Europe ends at the Bosphorus, for example, we talk about European Turkey and Asian Turkey. So to conduct the analysis of whether Europeans are different from non-Europeans, in this study we did the analyses twice, once in which we took the Urals as a boundary and once in which we took the Bosphorus as a boundary, and then we hoped that we would get the same results from both analyses. Mostly we did, once or twice we did not. In the results I'm going to present to you, I mostly give the results from the narrowly defined Bosphorus boundary. The non-European samples uh, were adult, well all the respondents were adult respondents. Um, and what I've done listed there is all the samples from outside of Europe and in red the ones that fall outside the boundary of Europe in the broad definition, in, no, other way around, outside on the narrow definition and inside on the broad definition. The European samples were drawn uh, from these various groups and you will notice that these respondents were not students, they were adults. Okay, who collected all this data? Well, lots and lots of colleagues, some of whom are here. Uh, and thanks to all of them for all the hard work that they put in. So the question is, are the hypotheses supported in looking at the data on each of these very different measures? And looking first at the measures of beliefs, find that on the measure of immutability, Europeans scored significantly higher than non-Europeans. On the measure of contextualism, in other words, whether you think that uh, you can understand people without reference to the social context, uh, Europeans scored low. So those two results, although they look as though they're in opposite directions, agree with each other. They're saying that there are beliefs in Europe about the immutability and clarity of the conception of an individual uh, without much reference to the social context. Okay, that's beliefs. Now, in terms of self-controls, we looked at six different dimensions. The seventh one didn't come very clearly in terms of the measurement reliability. And you see that this data shows Europeans to score significantly higher on three of the six dimensions of self-control. Europeans, compared with non-Europeans, perceive themselves as more different from other people. They perceive themselves as more committed to other people and they perceive themselves as higher on self-expression. Self-expression, the opposite of that end of that scale is harmony, so that is saying Europeans like to express themselves in more forthright manner. 
Commitment to others is one of the most interesting findings of this study because most people would think, oh, commitment to others, that's an aspect of collectivism. That's not what individualists do. Individualists are self-centered. The opposite of commitment to others on this measure was self-centeredness. So Europeans talk in terms of their commitment to the welfare of other people more than people in the other non-European samples. I think this finding in some ways is of particular interest because it shows the value of unpackaging the global concept of collectivism and looking to see um, which particular facets of independence and interdependence actually do differentiate people from different parts of the world. Okay, so that self construes and then the question is uh, what comparisons can we do in terms of values and, oh wait a moment, I'm sorry, we also need to look at variance. Variance in, in uh, contextualism, you see that the non-Europeans showed much greater variability in contextualism, both on the measure of immutability and on the measure of contextualism, so that supports the expectations that we had. And if you look at the variance in self-construals, you see that, again, difference. There is very much more variance in the non-European sample than there is in the European sample. But the variance on the other two measures that, for which the mean was significantly different, there is no significance of the variance. Now, in terms of values, uh, this um, Schwartz values, um, uh, delineation of different dimensions is probably very familiar to all of you. And what we found within this database was that um, Europeans scored significantly higher on autonomy and they scored significantly higher on egalitarianism and harmony. And the variance was not significant. Okay, that was one database. We also looked at the data on the World Values Survey, which now includes 10 items of new samples. So we have to consider again, uh, where does Europe end? Because the samples in the World Values Survey are different from the values in the CRN survey. Uh, in this case, um, the samples here from Europe and from the rest of the world, I haven't listed them all, but there were lots and lots of them. And this time we have six problematic nations who have to be either included or excluded. If we look at Schwartz values from the World Values Survey, this time there is no difference in autonomy, but there continues to be a significant difference in endorsement of egalitarian values. Um, Oh, in the Schwartz Value Survey, we actually combine the dimensions of egalitarianism um, and mastery harmony. Um, the variance in this case was significantly different, both for autonomy and for egalitarianism harmony. Okay, time goes by, and I should summarize the first half of my talk, and we see that there are some elements of distinctness distinctiveness, seeing people as immutable, yes, believing that one can understand a person with less relevance to context, yes, seeing oneself as distinctive, yes, seeing oneself as concerned for others, yes, and as expressive, certainly, and the WVS and CRAN values measures both give similar findings, so there's some replicability of the results. Uh, the variation in variance is not so great. Okay, so if Europeans are different, what are the implications and what is the relevance of that? Well, I want to look quickly at aspects of European distinctiveness. How committed are people to the European con commitment? Are they committed for the same amount of or the same reasons? And what factors favor convergence or divergence? Drawing on World Values Survey, we can see that mostly people from the different European countries are moderately lukewarm about the European community. Five point scale, no country scores very much above three. So the question is, 
does identification with the European community relate to the distinctive values which I've just shown in the previous slides characterize Europeans? And it turns out, no. There are different reasons for identifying with the European community in terms of values. If you look at the right-hand side, you see a series of East European nations. Those nations in which openness to change was strongly endorsed are more identified with the European community, whereas in other nations further to the West, the findings are the other way around, and even in Sweden, significantly negative. If you look in terms of the Schwartz dimension of self-transcendence, you find the same thing that the values associated with identification with being in Europe are different. Now, if you don't identify with being European, what do you identify with? Probably identify with your nationality. So, what's, I want to now report to you a study I did about 15 years ago in which we looked to see how strongly did students in different countries identify with being European or with their own nationality. And you see that at that time, there were two samples in Germany and in Barcelona who identified strongly, more strongly with being European than they did with being their own nationality. I think there are distinctive reasons why Germans and Catalonians might go that way, but everybody else uh, were more concerned with their nationality than with Europeanness, and if you look at the correlation between those measures, you see that the people in most countries who identified strongly with their nationality also identified strongly with being European, but in one country they didn't. Uh, so in 2000, <laughs> British, British students, British students in my university, a liberal, humane, cosmopolitan university were already thinking that there was a choice between being European and being British. Okay, so what are the consequences of identifying with being European? It's a very interesting recent study that, um, hello, what's happened? Oh yes, how much is European identification changing over time? Well, um, it's low, remaining low in the UK and in some other countries it's going up and down. I want to move on a bit. Uh, here's an interesting very recent study that Eva Green and other colleagues in Switzerland have just completed. Uh, they have looked at 22 different European nations and measured two things. Firstly, identification with being European and secondly, the level of prejudice that they felt against immigrants. And they examined the variation in that correlation in relation to an index called MIPEX, which measures all sorts of aspects of governmental policy towards the inclusion of migrants within culture. And what they found that the nations with less inclusive policies showed a stronger link between individual level identification with being European and prejudice. So there are consequences in terms of government policy, in terms of whether the European con project can sustain levels of immigration. In order to understand that more fully, I want to talk about another important study that came out a few years ago, again sampling a whole series of European nations, and they asked people, what is the basis for your true nationality? Do you think nationality can be defined in terms of language or your citizenship or your ancestry? And they made a distinction between civic citizenship, that's based simply on being a citizen of one's country, or nations in which people thought that nationality was defined by essentialist concepts such as speaking the language. And then they looked to see how much prejudice there was against immigrants on the basis of the difference between a citizenship definition and an essentialist definition. They found that the results were significant at the nation level, not the individual level, so it doesn't make much difference what you think. What, matter, what matters is what happens in your cultural context. And the European nations where identification and prejudice were unrelated were the ones that thought about citizenship. 
in terms of civic definitions, for example, Czech Republic, Portugal, Russia, Ireland, and Hungary. Yeah, okay. Whereas the European nations where identification prejudice were positive related were those in which people thought about nationality in essentialist terms rather than civic terms. So this defines the problem of how to sustain uh, a European identity in situations where people feel challenged or threatened. Uh, there is some research mostly done in Belgium in which experimental studies were done in which they encouraged people to think about Europe as being uh, Europeans as being very similar to oneself and they showed within laboratory settings that that was um, actually caused an increased measure of European identification but I think those kind of effects are ones that you can obtain in laboratory settings but out there in the real world persuading people that all Europeans are similar is not very likely to be effective more likely tolerance of diversity would give a more secure basis for a European identity if we acknowledge there is huge variability within Europe, but our values say that that is something that we find value in, then that would be a more secure basis for thinking in those ways. Now, threats and challenges are the, the issues that need to be considered in thinking about how these problems can be addressed. I suspect many of you are familiar with Oldport's contact hypothesis, very um, extensive research in that field, but the implications of the study by Pe Pearson and others that I just talked about is that in civic European contexts, positive contact is likely to have beneficial effects, but an essentialist European context risks negative contact effects. And I want to quote you a study which is reported in some detail. Oh, wait a moment, I'm going to skip that. Um, I want to talk to you about this study. Um, uh, Binder, Brown, Zagevka and colleagues studied school children in UK, Belgium and Germany. And these were children who had at least, minority children, who had at least one majority friend within the school. And the reason why I'm talking to this, talking about you, to, uh, talking to you about this study, is it longitudinal. And if we want to understand the dynamics of becoming more fully or less fully involved in the European project, we need to look at longitudinal studies because then we can begin to understand causal relationships. So what these researchers did was they looked at measures of. Um, Yes, that's right. Um, measures of the degree to which they had contact with um, people of um, minority children with majority children or the other way around uh, and the degree to which they had preferences. Um, I think I've jumped a, an overhead. Yes, okay, let's stick with this. If a child has contact with a child from the other ethnic group at time one, and then you measure prejudice at time two, there was decreased prejudice. But on the other hand, if the child reported a prejudiced attitude at time one, then that led to reduced contact at time two. In other words, causal relationships can go in both directions. It's not simply a question that more contact will lead to reduce prejudice. It's very important to have some understanding of this. And if we look at this one, this is the same data set, but these are measures of preferences for acculturation. We find that high prejudice at time one led to a preference in the majority respondents, it led to a preference for minority assimilation whereas low prejudice led to a preference for minority culture maintenance. But in the minority respondents, the pattern is exactly the opposite way around. So again, we see a causal relationship which suggests a two-way um, issue. Now, these are situations in which contact between um, ethnic minority groups in different cultures 
elicit a whole range of different threats. And that's fine, I'll be done in five. Um, a variety of studies have looked to, agree to see the extent to which immigration is perceived as a threat in different countries, and it seems as though there are different results in different contexts. We find, for example, if you look at the one at the bottom there, the attitudes towards foreigners within German regions is unrelated to the actual percentage of foreigners, but predicted by the perceived percentage of foreigners. So there are issues to do with the way in which these issues are addressed. And I want to talk about that simply in order to satisfy Pavel's original suggestion that I should talk to you about Brexit. So here goes. The Brexit catastrophe. What happened in Britain? Why are we leaving the EU? At least I think we are. It's naturally not even quite clear yet whether we are or not. Um, but if you look at the data from the Brexit vote in the UK, it says something very interesting about the nature of threat which drives these kind of issues, at least within the UK. Here we go. These are the election results in which we decided as a nation to leave. If you look on the left-hand side is the data for those who voted remain. You look on the right-hand side, these are the data for in locations in which the majority voted to leave. And the dots on the chart are the results from particular voting districts within the UK. Uh, the, up the left-hand side, you see the proportion of foreign-born population within the UK, and you see a counterintuitive result. The regions within the UK in which there were lots of foreigners voted to remain, and the regions within the UK in which there were very few foreigners voted to leave. So, how do we understand this process? What was, what was happening? Notice in particular the region labelled as Boston on the far right-hand side. This is an area in the east of England in which large numbers of Polish people, um, some have settled permanently and others come on an annual basis for harvesting ag agricultural crops. This graph shows the same voting results, but this time the axis up the left-hand side shows the percentage of the population who arrived in the UK in the last 10 years. So in Boston, the increase in um, non-British uh, population increased by 450% over those last 10 years, and the um, direction of the graph makes clear that this is a very plausible reason as to who voted in which way. That the recent increase of immigration was perceived as a threat by people in the areas of the UK who were not used to um, a heterogeneous population. So, I think this um, illustrates the more general question of threats that I referred to earlier. Okay, so now I need to summarize um, there we are. So summarizing what I've been saying to you, uh, firstly, compared to the rest of the world, those in European samples more strongly endorse egalitarian values. They see themselves as different from others. They see themselves as concerned for others. They understand others with less reference to context. And compared to the rest of the world, they vary less in egalitarian values. They vary less in their self-concepts for difference. And they vary less in their endorsement of, you know, there is less variability. Um, in contextualism. So these results refine and reflect Durkheim's understanding of the collective consciousness that arises through urbanization and secularization. Continuing my summary, the values of those who identify with being European differ between Eastern and Western Europe. The relationship between identification with being European and with one's own nationality differs between nations and over time. 
identification with being European is associated with less prejudice towards minorities. The link between national identification and higher prejudice is found only in nations where nationality is construed in essentialist terms. Positive contacts tend to reduce prejudice and increase identification with being European. Perceived threats tend to enhance prejudice and reduce identification with being European. So overall, I would say that Europeanness is a fragile and contested entity that has evolved through centuries of conflict, consolidation, migration, and immigration. And we need to work to sustain and develop its potential in addressing an uncertain future. Thank you.